my father's place, proclaiming Jesus Christ to the world. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. I want you to know that anyone who is teaching this word and makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside is not teaching you this word because this word is living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. So when you hear me speak, and you say, Pastor Sue, you're mean. I'm not mean. <laughs> the purpose of this dividing is that you would see your heart and repent. And he would change it. That's the whole point. So this message is, you have had your way. And I'll pray and then get right into it. You'll want to be in Jeremiah 3, but you will also want to put a marker in Isaiah 29. So, Lord Jesus, I know what it is to have my way. And I know what it is for you to have your way in me. May that be clearly seen through what you have given me to preach today. And may it be in your power, I give you my mouth, that you speak from it in your name, I pray. Amen. You have had your way. And I'm going to jump into the scripture from Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah 3, verses 4 through 5. And then I'll explain it and exhort you. So Jeremiah 3, 4. Have you not just now called to me, says the Lord, my father, you are the friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Then the Lord says, behold, you have spoken and have done evil things and you have had your way. Now, literally, you have had your way means in the original Hebrew, you have done all the evil you can do. So that was Judah in the days when Jeremiah prophesied, and also even 150 years ago prior to Jeremiah, 150 years prior to him, Isaiah said the same things to Judah. So think of it, the Lord gave Judah 150 years to repent, and they did not. 150 years, and they continued. Why? Oh, they loved the words of the sons of hell who spoke to them and said, everything's fine between you and God, while they did evil things against the Lord. The Lord had exhorted them, you're doing evil. And he had warned them of the consequences. Here's what will happen if you continue to do evil. And they had not listened. So they were warned about the consequences of having their way, and yet they insisted on having their own way. Now, at this point, they were about to be overrun by Babylon. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, was called by the Lord, the Lord's servant. His servant? A pagan king? Oh, yes. To mete out the judgment that Isaiah had warned about 150 years prior and that Jeremiah was warning about now. Their response is, oh, you are my father. You are the friend of my youth. Why are you doing this to me? Oh, will he be indignant to the end? Poor us. Poor me. I have had my way. And now the consequences, which I have been warned of for 150 years, are coming upon me. Boo-hoo. My goodness. Did you notice there wasn't any repentance in their cries? They just said, you're our father.
brother, you're the friend of our youth. How can you do this to us? Uh Uh-oh, they're judging him. And you know, when you judge the Lord, he has every right to judge you. So they tried to sway him. Oh, don't you remember, Lord? Oh, he remembers everything. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of him with whom we must give an account when we stand before him in the day of judgment. He knew everything they were doing. He replied to their plea, oh, please, by saying, you have not only spoken, but you have done evil things. Therefore, despite my warnings, you have stubbornly continued to have your own way, and I now am going to let my judgment fall upon you. You have spoken and have done evil things, and you have had your way. You have done all the evil you could. So, I was the same. I was the same. I had my own way. I was a rebellious teenager, and I forced my parents at the age of 17 to allow me to marry a drug dealer. They didn't know that part. And so I married this guy, and he was very violent and ended up beating me so badly that I bled internally. At that point, I left him. If I had not left him, he would have killed me. And so I didn't believe in divorce, though, because there was this little tiny bit of Christianity somewhere away in the distant past when I was a little kid and going to church. So I didn't believe in divorce. And so there I was, I was back home, and I'm lying in bed, and I have to make a decision, and it's a decision to permanently leave him, and that's not according to God. So I cried out in the night and I said, Lord, I don't have the strength. Actually, I said, God, not Lord. And I heard in my heart, you have my strength. Now, I had been strung out from being on drugs and suddenly not being on drugs. And I was just a mess. My personality had been totally erased by him and everything that I had done for drugs. The very next morning, my original personality had returned, and I was completely, in that moment, cured of my drug addiction in a moment of time. How merciful he was to me, a sinner with a capital S. How merciful! Oh my goodness! So, I knew it was all right to divorce him because I said I didn't have the strength to do it and he knew that I didn't believe in it. You have my strength. My goodness. It was right in his eyes. So, what was my response? (laughs) I went on with my life and had my own way. Just like a lot of people who he touches, And then they say, thanks a lot, see you later. Yeah, so I left him in the dust. I planned a whole new life for myself. I met Jeff at college. He was an atheist at the time. And we thought the same about many things. And we enjoyed each other's company, and we fell in love, and we got married 44 years ago. But I continued having my own way, even creating my own Jesus out of my own imagination. Hmm. So I was my own false prophet. I was just as bad as the sons of hell in pulpits across this nation and across the earth today. I was just as bad because I'd made up my own Jesus who worked for me. 
who didn't require anything of me so I could go do my life. Ha! And the so-called church does the same today. The sons of hell say, ah, don't worry, just there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. You can just go ahead and keep doing it. And uh, since you've said these words at an altar, or you've spoken these words in a prayer, oh, I believe in you, Jesus. You're set for life and eternal life, even in heaven, beyond, even though you're sinning like crazy against the Lord. They speak lies that sound so good to the ears of those who want to have their way. So these infants in Christ, oh my. Oh, infant in Christ, you have had your way. But what is your life like with you having your own way? I have told you what mine became. Even if you've done nothing else, you've created your own Jesus out of your own imagination based on what you have heard from sons of hell in pulpits across the earth. You do just as I did when I had my own way. So you're your own false prophet, just like I was. The Jesus you have made that doesn't offend you is not the Jesus of the Bible. You have chosen to worship another Jesus. Sounds good to you. So you have had your way just like Judah. Uh-oh, Judah was about to be overrun by the enemy, and so are you. Who's the enemy? Satan. You have continued to sin after being saved from God's wrath and reconciled to him. It is a fearful thing to stand before God when your heart is in that condition. You have readily believed any lie that comes along that lets you keep on having your own way. Therefore, just as he did with me, he will sift you like wheat. Do you know what it is to sift wheat? It isn't to go like this. You throw it up in the air so the wind blows away the chaff because the chaff is no good. It's a violent throwing in the air. He will forcefully toss you in the air so that all the lies and all the having your own way is revealed for what it is. Chaff, useless. He will blow away everything you have trusted and relied upon. He will remove all of the things that support you, all of the lies on which you have stood, so that you fall on your face. Hallelujah. It's really good to fall on your face. You know, Peter fell on his face. Jesus had said, I must be crucified. And he said, May it never be. And do you know what Jesus called Peter? He said, away from me, Satan. Away from me, Satan. Because Satan was speaking through Peter to try to tempt Jesus not to do what he had been sent to do. Of course, there was no chance that was going to happen. But Peter did it because Peter thought Jesus was a savior from Roman rule, and he was going to make their lives better by reestablishing the kingdom of Judah and sitting on the throne of David and ruling. So, you can't die. All those things I want from you will not happen if you die. All those things I want you to do to make my life better, those won't happen if you're crucified. His crucifixion set into motion the very thing that is going to set Peter free from his pride. He thought he knew better than God. He was going his own way, wasn't he? So the characteristics 
of those who have their way are in Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Oh, I used to think I was very wise. I was going to be free of my parents, and I was going to be free to do drugs whenever I wanted to. <laughs> Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight, their own eyes, their own sight, their cleverness, their wisdom. Ah, homosexuality, no problem. Not all the other sexual perversions, no problem. Oh, these are good things. Greed is good. Lying is good if it will get you what you want. And, uh, oh, by the way, you cannot help but sin. But God understands, say the sons of hell. So you have followed them, you have had your way. You and the sons of hell think you are wiser than God. And you mock his wisdom. Oh, that was for then. God's not mean. He won't deal with me. Oh, yes, he will. By this very word. If your heart is not so hardened that it can't be pierced by his word. So, what does the Lord say he will do with those who have had their way? The consequences are in Isaiah 29, verse 1 through 4. Woe, O Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped. Add year to year, observe your feasts on schedule. I will bring, bring distress to Ariel. And she will be a city of lamenting and mourning, and she will be like an aerial. An aerial is an altar hearth, a place of burning. She is like an aerial to me. I will camp against you, encircling you, and I will set siege works against you, and I will raise up battle towers against you. Then you will be brought low from the earth, you will speak, and from the dust where you are prostrate, spread out on your face, your words will come. Your voice will also be like that of a spirit from the ground, and your speech will whisper from the dust, Help me! Help me! An altar hearth is a place of burning. Do you know that Jerusalem was burned to the ground by the Lord's servant? King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon? Ariel, Ariel, Jerusalem, burned. An altar harp, a place of burning. That's what he did. Why? They had had their way. Yeah, they had appeared at the synagogue. He says, you know, observe your feasts on schedule and all of that. Oh, they, they were right there when they were supposed to be there. Their hearts weren't there, but they were there. And they went through all the motions and they sang the songs and they got up and sat down when they were supposed to. And then they went out and sinned like crazy, just like I see in today's church. Being a pastor, oh, you can't believe what I know that most people don't see. Not because I'm a snoop, but because the Lord shows me what's in a heart. You know how it's a dead giveaway? By the words you speak, because of, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. So I know what's in your heart by what you say. If you're ho hum Toward the Lord. <laughs> I know what's in your heart. They had their way doing all the evil they could. And I'll speak to the rebellious response to that in a minute. They did all the right stuff outwardly, but they were having their own way. 
So it's the same for you who rebel against the Lord today. So he will make you an altar, hearth, a place of burning. He will call you Ariel because you have refused to listen to those who he has sent to you again and again to warn you, to exhort you regarding your sin and warn you of its consequences again and again. So unless you turn from having your way, he will sentence you to eternal burning when you stand before him in the day of judgment. That will be your altar heart. As he says in Isaiah 29.4, in between now and the day of judgment, he will humble you. You will whisper from the dust. He will bring you very low. I could not have been much lower than I was after my first husband beat me. And in the midst of being totally in a fog from the sin I committed, from the drugs that I took. So you will be humbled. Why? Because you think highly of yourself, your wisdom, but you think little of him. So he will make you very small. And if you still refuse to let him have his way, you will be subject to burning. This place is real, Jesus says. In Mark 9, 44 through 48, he describes it. It is a place where the worm never dies. That is, you are eternally tortured and the fire is never quenched. That is, you continually burn forever. So, what's the response of rebels? Oh, Isaiah 30, verse 9. For this is a rebellious people, false sons, false children. If you rebel against God, you are not his son. You are not his daughter. Do not be deceived. Sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, you must not see visions. And to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusion. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. That's what you'll say. Get out of here. I like these illusions that are prophesied to me. I like these smooth words. I like these things that tell me I can keep on having my way. And they'll say, too, when they are under his judgment here, they will say, I don't deserve that, Lord. I'm a good person. I do good things, and I'm trying to be better and better all the time. No one is good, not even one. As long as you have a sin nature in your heart, you are not good. You got sin in you. You were born with it because you're the offspring of Adam, the first sinner. So you will continue. I know from my own experience. Look, I was, he said, you have my strength. I mean, you would have thought I'd have turned to him. No, went my own way. Sin nature is still alive and well. Thanks be to God, he crucified it and purified my heart. When I was filled with the Holy Spirit, that is the cure for you and your rebellion, O oh, church, O oh, infant in Christ. None of us is good not even one, and if you rebel against him and say, no, I don't need that, no, I want to do what I want to do, you reveal that you are not his child. This is a rebellious people, false sons, false children. You're not his if you rebel against him. 
Think on that. That's a very powerful truth. You will tell me to go away, <laughs> just like in this passage from Isaiah 30. Get out of here. We don't want to hear that. We like what our sons of hell tell us. But if I go away, the Lord will send another just like me, speaking the same thing. We will say, repent. Obey Jesus Christ's commandments regarding the Spirit. Stay in the city until you are inwardly clothed on high with his power. Oh, wait for the promise of the Father. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, which you will receive not many days from now, he said to people who had been baptized in water already. And then he says, when you do those things, when you stay and wait, we will come in. We will crucify your sin nature. We will purify your heart. Oh, my. And we. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we will come and fully and permanently indwell you, and you will not disobey us anymore, and you will not go your own way because the one who is in you, you love with his love, and he has freed you from your rebellious sin nature. Glory to God. We cannot stop speaking of what we have seen and heard. Shut me up, and someone else will be right along. So, here's his promise to those who repent from Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13. This is the repentance part. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you turn away from having your way and you seek him, with all of your heart, not so he can give you something, but so that he can cleanse your heart and fill you with himself. He says this, Jeremiah 29, 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes. That means that has nothing to do with money or prosperity. It means release you from your captivity. Captivity to what? Your sin nature. Just as he promises, just as Jesus Christ says in John 8, 31. If the Son sets you free, you will be completely free. And the context there is of sin. Because a couple of verses earlier in John 8, he says, those who sin are slaves to sin. But he will set you completely free. If you seek him with all of your heart, you will find him. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. It was so wonderful when I found him. <laughs> because then I just offered myself to him completely. Not for myself, but because I wanted to give testimony of him. He healed me of an incurable disease, progressive multiple sclerosis, in 2001. And I thought that was all I was going to be testifying about. Ha ha. <laughs> Lots of times when he speaks to me, I see it this way. And he says, oh, no, it's like this. Oh, I got you now, Lord. Sometimes. Most of the time I see the big picture. But once in a while, it's like, oh, OK, well, that's just for this circumstance. No, it's for always. And to have him fully and permanently indwell me, oh, my goodness. Oh, it is joy inexpressible and full of glory, and it is powerful and makes you his witness here. Ones through whom the world will know that the Father sent the Son. That's your purpose here. It isn't to sit in a pew on Sunday and so, yeah, 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 you say that, yeah, 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 and then you go out and do what you want and have your way. No, no, no. This is what it is. His witness here. Ones through whom the world will know, and the world will have no excuse, will they? So, O oh, infant in Christ, you have had your way just as I did, and you have dug yourself into a pit, 
just as I did. You have brought judgment on yourself by him, the purpose of which is to wake you up. So you say, oh, Lord, I see the disaster of going my way, having my way. Now you'll say, but your life was not a disaster when you went your own way and you went back to college and you met Jeff, your husband, now of 44 years, and isn't that good? I was still as lost as I had been when I was a drug addict. So I still would have stood before him and he would have condemned me because I was still sinning, just not in the same way. Therefore, I exhort you to repent, to turn from what you're doing, to turn from the sons of hell who are feeding you lies. To get up off your duff and spread out on the floor and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. He will. Lord Jesus, have your way with this word, this sharp sword you have given me. In your name I pray, amen. The fields are white and the workers are few. But the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.